I'm going to go ahead and introduce our next guest here. Um, we have our Creative Shorts fellow joining us, Renee Geller, and her film is uh, Healing Ribbons One Stitch at a Time. And in the, in the spirit of healing, um, you all are free to stand up and stretch and just uh, move your bodies a little bit if you need to wake back up. And we'll welcome uh, Renee up to the stage. Come on up, Renee. <laughs> uh, good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Renee Geller, and I would ask my elders to forgive me for speaking before you and forgive any mistakes I may make. <coughs> Healing ribbons, um, excuse me. Healing ribbons, one stitch at a time, is in the pre production phase of our expo expository mode documentary. Our mentor is Bridget Timmerman. And she went to the Chicago Co-op to learn about documentary filmmaking. She uh, did a full-length feature film. It was called uh, Umaha AE, and it won the 2018 Best Documentary Award at the International Red Nation Film Festival, and also Outstanding Documentary Award at the 2019 Western Heritage um, <clears throat> Award. Healing Ribbons is the 501c3, and it started because of uh, Tammy Buffalohead as a co-founder, and she asked her niece what would help her to heal after her mother was murdered, and she said she wanted to learn to sew. So then she started a group in Omaha of uh, intergenerational people to sew and um, that's part of our group our meeting uh, we will be filming our interviews at moxie studios for the interviews and the ladies as i put up, up here that um, they have her stories instead of history but it's going to be her stories so right now we have two women that will be doing their stories. And then our third one um, backed out because when we asked her about it, she said yes. And then as time goes on and we're waiting for the grant approval, um, she's changed her mind. So we're currently looking for, oh, well, we have some other ladies that we might interview. And it's intergenerational. So we have, we make sure that it's, um, of all ages, younger and older. And our crew is all Native women, and except for our um, mentor, and then the one who's going to help us with filming in the studios, Moxie Studios. Um, The film is about a group of indigenous intergenerational women residing in Omaha. They embark on transformative journey of healing through collective wisdom, stories, and ceremonies, and they reclaim the art of sewing, regalia, making, and beading. You'll see their individual collective stories and of cultural reclamation and uniting to overcome intergenerational trauma by sharing their stories to foster empathy, resiliency, and dialogue around healing, cultural reclamation, and um, preservation. And then Tammy Buffalo Head is the one that um, is head, the head of Healing Ribbons. She's our board member. Alex Leverin is our also a co-producer. Fawn Webster is our co-director, mentee, and Sierra Buffalo Head is a co-director and she will edit her mentee and then she's also gonna share her, her story. 
And then Angel Geller, she's our uh, videographer. We also have another one, um, Autumn Geller. So we have two generations of women up here that are working on the film. And then we also have three generations from my family that are also gonna help with the film. So we have different ages. And then Trinity Eden is gonna share her story. Kim Bedford, also a history teller. Valerie Kilspro and Judy are our culture bearers. So they help the ladies to do what um, sewing or teaching and that's real helpful. We're gonna film at a round dance that we are hosting, and then we'll have a feathering ceremony for uh, people so they'll be able to enter the arena. We're gonna have um, a fashion show. It's our second annual fashion show um, coming up. And then we also have um, another event, I'm sorry. But we're hosting all these events and they're well attended. Our group has grown up. That's amazing. Okay, and lessons learned thus far. If you don't know what you don't know, it's sharp. It's a sharp and fast paced learning curve. We went through staff changes. We put together a really strong women crew. It just ranges from 17 to 67. We have women from both, oh, I already said that, the generations. And then I talked to George about once we got our grant, I asked for advice. And she said, read your contracts closely and stay organized. Don't be afraid to ask for help where needed. And delegation is powerful. So thank you. Thank you, Renee. It sounds like a really um, powerful and interesting story. I will have to say that when they applied for the um, during their application process, they did a really great job on their application and they really painted a picture of their visuals. So it looks to be a really interesting story. So to move on, I will introduce our next panel, which will be Legacy of the Land with Chris Neighbors and Kanisha McGlashan Price. Sorry if I. Alito, so Chofo, ya Chris Neighbors, Chata Sia, Nova, PBS, Atoxali. Hi, my name is Chris Neighbors. I'm a member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, and I work with GBH and Nova's TV program. Uh, I'll move quick because I know we're getting close to lunch and everyone's hungry, but this is a really exciting project that I'm happy to share with you. And most exciting, we're actually going to have a premiere here today. We're going to have our, one of our short films actually premiering for the public for the first time, and that's super exciting. So first off, Legacy of the Land is a, a collection of six short documentaries covering climate change in Native American communities. Um, I don't think I have to tell this group or this audience exactly how important it is to hear from indigenous voices in Native communities when it comes to climate change. Um, but nonetheless, it's uh, obviously important for the PBS system and NOVA to include those voices as they navigate climate, environmental, and science stories. Uh, the way the run of show is going to go is we'll get to take a look at the series trailer so you can get a sense of all the different communities and environments we talked about in our digital series. And then the most exciting part is we get to actually watch Kanisha's short film, uh, Tides of Tradition. And afterwards, we'll have a pretty typical Q&A to hear about Kanisha's experience through the project and also hopefully talk to more young filmmakers and get them understanding how this process could work for them whenever they want to approach a similar project through Vision Maker and NOVA in the future. A couple other quick uh, thank yous and recognitions. Uh, you know, I'm a PBS fellow, which means that I was dropped into the PBS system not too long ago to um, you know, represent un underrepresented uh, communities and indigenous voices. And that's a pretty disorienting journey for me personally. So I wanna make sure to thank a couple people who made that uh, a bit more clear for me. Uh, first off, I wanna thank some of the storied filmmakers that are already in the system, Dan Golding, Colleen Thurston, and Brooke Sweeney. Our interactions were probably brief for you, but they were a guiding light for me. Um, also, of course, I wanna make sure to thank the Choctaw Cultural Center for this opportunity to um, come back home to my tribe, but also to share this with the, the, the public media system. 
And then finally, uh, I want to make sure to thank Vision Maker and Nova for understanding the importance of this collaboration and how this uh, these stories should live in, in two worlds, if you will. Um, okay, so with that, I'd like to go ahead and roll uh, tape, and we'll see the trailer, and then follow that with Misha's film, and then Misha will come up and be able to introduce herself. Thank you. See, one time I had to go five years, no fish. How do we carry our traditions if we don't have the resource available? We rely quite a bit on being able to live a subsistence lifestyle. We're currently in a mega drought. Water is sacred. We're right on ground zero here. If we didn't take it, it'd be out in the ocean here. We're here. We've been here forever. We've been stewarding these waters and these lands. We're doing our part as, as Indigenous people. The action has to be now. The action has to be by us. that beauty that you have with the land and most of all with your people. Let's go see what you find out. able to go out on pretty much any waterfront and you could hear the the sea lions roaring like motorcycles out on the front beach or pretty much anywhere you went nowadays for sea lions i mean you can go pretty much all the coastline within the bay area and go without saying a single sea lion Back when I first started learning how to hunt, wasn't wasn't a problem. <laughs> a lot of what I remember as a young kid was basically being in the outdoors, pretty much living a subsistence lifestyle any way we could. And for us, that meant setting crab pots and setting long lines, going out how fishing by pole, and then just slowly waiting for each species to fish to come out throughout the months. And I mean, that's just basically my calendar. My name is Trevor Schleby. I'm from Unalaska or uh, Dutch Harbor. I am 24 years old. Anything that I could take from nature and put on the table for the family is what I would consider subsistence. I would just say it's a good good source of food security um, for us, and we rely quite a bit on being able to live a subsistence lifestyle. It's definitely important to the community because not a lot of people have access to the resources where we do traditional subsistence hunting or fishing. So I'm not only fishing or hunting for myself, it's for other community members too. When they say cockamigo birds, fish, plants, berries, tidal foods, it's something we can eat throughout the year if we preserve it right. Subsistence is so important to me. Here's the hearts of the birds they learn about. Cute chunk. And there's another color by number color guide. My name is Marie Sleepy. 
I'm from Alaska. I'm from here, raised here. I'm the Head Start lead teacher here for the full day program. I have three boys. Trevor, he's my he's my middle son. We teach three to five year olds, and it's basically the way I think about it is like family style, like anything they're doing at home. We're teaching them here. Oh, look at Here's the unang kamganigich and paragus lagich is a Canadian key. So this is what they've learned this last week, the different birds. And then here we go over this poster. This is the kakamigo unit. And then the nutrients. Here's what I was talking about, comparing the chicken and the wild duck. Well, I like to fish and um, hunt. For instance, during the wintertime, we love to hunt ptarmigan and cook it up. Like I said, we just did the bird unit here in the classroom. So these are already cleaned. They're the breasts of the bird. And we just got them this, this last month. Okay, so where are we going to start off? Ptarmigan are just in the winter time. They're these little birds that I'd say are like the size of pigeons. In comparison, I guess you can say they're just like grouse. Yeah, the bottom one. And it's a pretty simple process okay. for cleaning them. It's just split right down the middle. I'll let it soak overnight in salt water. After we soak it, uh, I'll freeze the whole breastplate. And then uh, once we're ready to cook them up, basically filleting off of the bone and getting as much meat off the off there as you can. So this is a good Israel's part. Every time you drop off something, you always hear a story of how they miss it and what they used to do and where they used to go. And those are the the moments you try to cherish and remember. The number one complaint that I always hear is when are you going to get a sea lion? And that's just the hardest to come by because they're they're not as abundant in numbers anymore. And so that's like my number one question is when are you going to get me a, a sea lion or a cow? The last maybe five years, seen a population drop in sea lion. They're not getting the nutrition that they need for one thing. We're losing the ice in the Bering Sea. Climate has a lot to do with it. Sea temperature. And that changes the whole idea of where the food for them is at. It's moving north. And it's going to be, be that way until we find a way to cool down the water. I don't know if that could happen. It means to me, it means we have to continue to teach our young people the importance of taking care of the environment. It's about life, culture, and a way of living. We honor that fish, we honor that seal that held it pretty much gave itself up for you to survive so you got to take care of it and teach that value now trevor came up through the system at camp q and over the years has been curious about hunting fishing he, he understands the value of uh, taking care of subsistence life just take what you need. Don't take any more than that. If, if you're going to share it, then take what you're going to share and make sure you deliver it. Anytime that I can be on the water, I'll, I'll be out on my boat. It's just a calming sense to be on the water and out there practicing your traditional ways. 
now being one of the main hunters, uh, my job is basically selecting a student and passing on the knowledge. It's definitely rewarding um, just knowing that I'm able to pass on knowledge from my mentors. And now I'm in that position where I can be viewed as a mentor. I think there's only maybe one or two my age that actually go hunting anymore. With Trevor, uh, it's been watching his growth as a hunter and a fisherman his value will be that if he trains and moves it on to younger people okay you were doing it last time yeah okay we're trying to keep most of it overall no we used to watch the elders do it and then we didn't do it for a long time. They wouldn't let it touch it because it put holes in, <laughs> holes in the hive. So. Thank you. So as Kanisha makes her way up here, I will share that, again, there are six separate short films that are all broadly covering the theme of climate change in Native American communities. And uh, as you saw here, this is just one of them. They're all as unique and special. We one time had to go five years. Marie, you've had your moments, my turn. Uh, so uh, they're all as unique and special as, as the communities they come from. And I think that's one of the most exciting parts of this project is that not only hearing from separate communities that are touching on the same subject, but in their own voices, in their own ways, but also separate filmmakers, thus demonstrating not only the diversity, the diversity of our voices, but also the diversity of our talent. So with that, let's go talk to Kanisha. All right, Kanisha, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to the folks? First off, um, it feels like an honor to have premiered this with you all. Um, incredible storytellers. So thank you for sharing space today. Um, Ong. Chiguyaka, ama Kanisha McGlashan Price, Asakta Cook, Unanga Akok, Elulam Tanev Gusi, Ilagan Angehta Cook. Ang, hello, my name is Kanisha McGlashan Price. My Unanga name is Chiguyaka, which means songbird. Um, I am from Eluluk, also recognized as an Alaska today. And um, yeah. So Legacy of the Land uh, branched off of a larger uh, GBH project, which was called Sea Change, the Gulf of Maine. And that's a three-part documentary series on broadcast. But um, through it, there was a thread of constantly and respectfully uh, returning back to the original uh, tribes and communities of the Gulf of Maine as they told the story of the Gulf of Maine and its place in climate change. So obviously Legacy of the Land is an extension of that project. And Kanisha, I want to kind of open up there. What did you feel like uh, as you went through the project, as you approached it and as you finished it, what you felt like your community was bringing to the conversation of climate change? And... I think when I first wrote um, my story pitch for this project, I was having, I focused on um, like the science aspect of why sea lions are moving north and, and how our, like how fisheries are contributing to that. Um, but I felt like when I went back to my community, I felt like there's this need for me to check a box of like a non-native scientist to be speaking on this subject um, when traditional knowledge is data and it is science. And so uh, that's why I, you know, chose to highlight Vince, one of our knowledge holders, and um, the story shifted to the importance of intergenerational knowledge sharing versus, you know, um, hammering the science story. 
And that's something that, you know, obviously occurs to Nova. Nova is clearly a science publication. We tell technical, tangible science stories, but that's just one way of understanding our world, right? That's just one way of trying to illustrate a physical part of our world. And uh, they realized that. And so therefore wanted to give space to filmmakers and communities like Kanisha's to cover the, cover the other side of the coin, if there even is the other side of the coin, give a full picture of an issue like climate change, because um, it's not just one metric or one measurement or one research paper. There's also the very clear cultural components that um, are sometimes even more informative to the problem. So Kanisha, what was it like just for you personally to tell your story in community? What was it like to you know use that as a platform? It was incredible. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I felt incredibly supported by my community members. Um, I think, uh, I think my, the knowledge holders that I was working with knew that I wanted to tell the story in a good way and, um, you know, trusted that I would care for their words. And, um, you know, I've been living in Washington for the past couple of years, so returning home to tell the story was really fun as well. Um, I just felt like a lot of community members were coming together to support this project. Um, many people just offering to, you know, help fly drones, the local news station lending me gear, um, the local corporation, like making sure all the land permits were in place so we could film on the land. Um, and so that just felt like a, um, it felt validating to be telling this story and seeing my community um, behind me. So there are production incentives in Indian country. Um, you know, one unique thing about Kanisha's film is that there are graphic components that you know, introduce us to different cultural elements that you know, inform her community's lens on the environment. Uh, Kanisha, I was wondering if you could tell me if there if there was a, a process or a, a, a rationale behind what you chose to feature graphically and define for us and what you chose not to. Um. I think what Chris is referring to is uh, one instance where I got a round of feedback um, from GBH asking me to like describe where Unalaska was. Um, and I didn't feel like that was necessary. Um, I think ultimately, like I want these stories to be like for our people and um, I didn't think it was necessary to describe that an Alaska is an island on the Aleutian archipelago that's not language that our community uses um, and using like putting the word kakomigu on the on the screen and I'm describing subsistence. Those are words that my community members could relate to. And so, yeah, I think that's why I chose to put those up there. And, uh, you know, for media partners in the public media system that may be watching or are here today, that's the importance of telling stories with community members involved or directing, you know, not just holding a microphone or, or moving a boom pole, but actually directing the story and having a major influence because it's our responsibility as native storytellers to walk in those two worlds and navigate between our community and your audience. So those small instances, like, are we going to completely spell out the geographic data of this community or not, um, really needs to fall back to native storytellers uh, and because we are the ones that have the relationships and are beholden to our community. Um, why don't we talk a little bit about the the process of getting involved with the project? Um, because that's part of what we want to do here today is build some excitement and interest for future projects at Vision Maker and their RFP platform. Uh, so uh, we were talking a little bit earlier about pitching and submissions, and uh, you know it occurs to me that that's kind of a 
difficult process for artists, right? Like you have a vision and it, that vision pertains to your medium, film probably. So how is that for you having to take your vision first and then break it down into a document basically or a pitch deck? Uh, I think that was definitely the hardest part for me was navigating the grant side of things and, um, you know, trying to convince people that this story was important to be told. Um, I think I leaned a lot to my mentors to navigate this process and, uh, you know, Last night, before, like to, in preparation for this, I was reading my original treatment, and um, I remember, you know, doing my first submission and being kind of um, told that I was in the second round, and I was asked, "Can you give us a treatment by Friday?" And I was like, "Yes, of course, I can give you a treatment." And then I was like, reached out to my mentor, I was like, "Hey, what's a treatment?" Um, so it was challenging, like navigating a lot of, uh, you know, verbiage I wasn't used to. Um, but also I think this grant gives you the opportunity to learn those things as you go. And, um, I also have Chris to thank a lot for that. Um, as an indigenous producer himself, I felt like he was advocating for me a lot along the way. And I don't think I would have had um, as an enjoyable of an experience without him. So yeah, thank you, Chris. No, you're welcome. I can point to the calendar any day. Uh, so, uh, well, for context on that experience, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your filmmaking background and history? Like, where were you coming from? What projects had you done previously? And, you know, that led you to this opportunity, to this moment? Um, I had had no, like, formal film experience um, I was a part of the 2021 Alaska Native Filmmakers Intensive, which was, uh, which received funding from Vision Maker Media. Um, and I think that was my real first, um, like, introduction to filmmaking. I've been working at my local news station for the last three years and uh, picked up a camera through working there and did, like, local uh, traditional food series but this was my first um, big project. And um, I think the Alaska Native Filmmakers Intensive gave me a lot of mentors that I was able to call on during this process. So the reason I asked that question is if, if you're entertaining, you know, pitching on, an, on another project that's coming up or a, a grant that pertains to other media funds or vision maker, um, you know, don't be too intimidated. You can call on other people who have been down that process. You can call on me if you want to, to, to talk about that, because it is a very um, foreign process of taking something that exists creatively in your mind in one medium, like I said, and then trying to break it down into the, what might feel like arbitrary different documents and submission spots. Uh, but that's just, that's how the process goes so often. So, um, you know, look at, is it a separate skill set? Look at it as, as something that um, isn't just part of filmmaking, but as part of the opening the door for filmmaking, um, unfortunately. But again, it's it's a, it's an obstacle that we all have to go through, and it's a muscle that you build over time. It doesn't mean that you're um, a bad filmmaker if you don't uh, aren't successful in that submission process. It means that you're just new to submission processes, kind of like being a good president versus being a good campaigner for president. They're two different things. Um, but I, I just want to point that out to you and give encouragement to those who are considering things like this that. Um, it can be done and it's just a different muscle. So don't fret. Um, you know, Kanisha, one thing that stood out to me uh, in your submission was how clearly, this might've been conscious, but how how clearly you had a sense of style. Um, I, I recognized your aesthetic and motif throughout your portfolio. And then it's clearly evident in your camera work and, and in how you chose to cover your story. Um, what was What was the experience of, of exploring your art and exploring your craft how did how did that go for you i think with each piece i'm still figuring that out 
Um, I think my style is slower and um, leaves room for leaves room for interpretation and people to like really sit with what's on the screen. Um, I, I actually think my one of the first drafts I sent over didn't have very much music in it and had a lot of natural sounds. Um, and I think in the future, I would want to uh, explore that a little bit more, maybe having um, like less talking in the film and more just humans um, in their element. But yeah, that's something I'm still figuring out. And these projects give you a platform to explore that. Yeah, if you're a young filmmaker, you know, for free, you can indulge what is curious or interesting to you from an art perspective. And so whenever you're applying and it, that, that becomes evident in your portfolio, uh, in your past work, what your vibe is, what your aesthetic is, what your look is, it doesn't necessarily have to define to one thing. And you can always be, you'll be exploring it for the rest of your career um, as Kanisha is. But, uh, you know, make sure to take the time to ask yourself what interests you, what excites you about this medium, about this art. Uh, and that'll be part of your cell. That'll be part of your pitch, part of what makes you attractive as a filmmaker to cover the stories that you want to cover is, you know, basically the paintbrush that you you cover them by. Um, I want to check with the group. Do we have any questions from the chat? Or I can keep. No. OK, keep going. Uh, oh, Francine. So this question is for you, Chris. Okay. Um, working in um, GBH and the liaison between Vision Maker Media and GBH with this project, what was the um, selection process, um, the cr cr critique of that selection process? Because I know we had more than six projects that submitted. And so if you could just talk through you know, how, what that process was. Okay. Yeah. So we had uh, over 20 submissions for the, for the, for the six spots that we had available. And it was really hard. Uh, they were all very compelling. They were all great stories in their own right. Uh, and so one of the first things we took a look at was, was it, was this, what, were those stories the right fit for this media block? Were they going to be successful short digital films or maybe they were better off as feature films. In fact, that's that was one of the first things I noticed is that some of them were going to be great feature films. Uh, they they didn't they wouldn't benefit from this opportunity because they need to go on to a different one or something that was more fitting with their vision. So that was the first thing is like, are we going to end up encroaching upon or crunching someone's uh, vision for their story based on our media parameters? Uh, and that's something to look at whenever you're looking at an opportunity. Does my story live best in the box that they're offering me? Um, the next thing was, and I think this is something that we're exploring just as uh, not as media, but also as uh, a country and as a community. What is an environmental story? What is a climate change story? Is there a difference? Um, I don't think we have the right answer there, but that was that was one of the other parts that uh, began to separate folks was, is it a climate change story? Is it an environmentalism story? Is it an advocacy story? And we were wanting to talk about climate change specifically. And that's a fine line that um, can be difficult to know outright. And then finally, the last one was, does your portfolio represent your ability to achieve the vision that you're expressing? The great thing about this series, as you'll see, is that there are multiple execution levels and they're all equally successful. So if you've never worked with a 8K red helium drone and you're gonna call for that in your vision, make sure you have a plan for that to be successful. Uh, but if you want to work with your phone and a selfie stick and you have lots of great success with that, that's also viable. That goes back to my point of knowing your craft, knowing your lens and your paintbrush, um, because these days technology has made it such that it's it's almost arbitrary whether you're using an amazing camera or not. Uh, you know, some ex executions um, obviously excluded. Um, so just know what what technology and what capabilities you're excited about and what you're capable of and just make sure that that's clear in your pitch 
um because that's that'll give the people reviewing it faith in and making it successful so kanisha one other uh one other thing i wanted to follow up on was uh camp q because uh you know we don't get to talk about it nearly as much as we probably should have in, in this format but I think it's a major component about uh, a component for why native communities actually have something um, unique and important to offer uh, the climate change conversation. So can you give people a little bit of background on what Camp Q is, and then of course, how it ladders into what uh, Vince shares later in the documentary? Um, yes. Uh, camp Kungayu is our annual culture camp on Unalaska Island. And it's where um, our youth and our uh, knowledge holders gather. And it's a week-long camp where, um, you know, we're learning how to fillet fish. We're learning about the language, song and dance. Um, you see the hunters harvesting a seal. And we're taught, like, how to use every part of the seal. Um, and... This is how we are sharing our knowledge between generations. Um, it's a camp that's put on the tribe. And uh, I think it, this is its 25th year of being a camp. Um, but it has really helped revitalize um, and helped a lot with our like remembering. Um, but yeah, I it's just goes to show like how how it's working with Vince being uh Vince mentoring Trevor as a kid and now Trevor being a mentor to the youth and that's kind of what I really wanted to highlight um was this intergenerational knowledge sharing and uh, you know how successful that's happening the the success that's happening in our community I, the reason I highlight that, like Kanisha said, is because the, these, whether they're social programs or youth programs like Camp Q, these are things that uniquely exist in indigenous and tribal communities where we're investing time, effort, and education into our environment. So it's only natural that then we would have something important to say, if not the most important thing to say about how climate change is going and, and what policy should be in place to to dictate that. That's how I came to uh, this subject matter was through grad school and climate change. And while I was there as an indigenous person, I was reading these policies, reading studies and I was like, where are all, where are all the native people involved in, <laughs> involved in this writing? So um, I was thrilled to be part of this project and uh, to bring those stories forward to again, call more awareness to it. Uh, can you show, is there anything else that you'd like to highlight or share about not only this story, but maybe your experience? I think for young filmmakers that are thinking about making a film in your community, um, n know that you are you are the one to make that film and tell the story. Um, your community members want to work with you. And, um, you know, understanding the traditional protocol in your community is really valuable. And uh, the reciprocity aspect, and um, you know, caring for your knowledge holder stories, and knowing that, uh, like them knowing that you want to tell it in a good way, is really valuable. Um, so yeah, you are meant to share your community stories. Hi, um, it's Francine again. And my question is for Chris. Chris, can you tell us two things? One is a little bit more your role, what you do as a producer fellow at GBH, as well as how did you become a producer's fellow? Where was that opportunity and are they continuing it for others who may be interested who want to apply? Okay. Yeah, so my fellowship is from PBS. It's called the PBS Accelerator Fellowship. Um, it is partnered with a mentorship program. Uh, so we had basically two branches. There's 
accelerator fellows like me. And we are about, there's about 10 of us, or there were 10 of us moving into their second year. Now there's four of us. We are mid-career professionals that maybe hadn't had the chance to work in public media, but now are given that opportunity. And of course, that's meant to diversify and uh, make a more inclusive environment within the public media system. So I'm I'm one of the Native American ones, but that we had people from all different backgrounds, races, creeds, religions. Is um, It's a really great group, and I was really excited to be part of that. Um, then, then that opportunity is coming open again for another class of fellows in a couple months. Uh, we're still working on exactly when that's going to be released, but keep your eye on your PBS feeds, and you'll definitely see that again. It's called the PBS Accelerator Fellowship. Uh, my role on this project was as the digital se series producer. So... Honestly, I need to give all credit to my filmmakers for the talent and the beauty of these these short films. My job really was to be like, hey, deadline. And that's really the extent of, of my ability. But, um, you know, we got to have someone looking at the calendar, and that's my job. Um, I would say between, between the meetings and between the deadlines, um, I would say my role was also to help PBS and Nova know when to lean in and when not to. Um, it's an educational process for both parties, right? These filmmakers are stepping into maybe opportunities they haven't had before, and they're learning just the process. It's a That's a more straightforward situation. But NOVA and PBS are getting to know Indigenous communities again, and they're beginning to understand how our stories work, how our values work, and what's important to us. Okay. Um, last thing I want to make sure to end on, is that this series is gonna be available September 13th on Nova's web. And in the week after we will be releasing one episode per week on YouTube. Uh, and one last big thank you to the filmmakers involved with this. It was um, a big effort and they punched well above what they were prompted to do. They made excellent films uh, and it'll show uh, across the PBS system. So I'm really excited that we had a chance to show and premiere one here today. And uh, please stay tuned for the rest on September 13th. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much to Chris and Kanisha for that um, wonderful presentation and being a part of, of the filmmaker family. Um, this is going out of order. If you are following the agenda or um, viewing on Whova, you might be a little confused. So I'd just like to introduce our next uh, Creative Shorts fellow, Sabrina, who's going to um, talk about her film a little bit that will uh, just gear us up and head it in the right direction for our lunch break. So Sabrina. Hi, my name is Sabrina, like the teenage witch. Um, <laughs> So my mom is Navajo and my dad is Bengali. So I have grown up with both Indian jokes, thanks to a lost man at sea in 1492. Uh, so my short film follows a biracial niece who's Navajo and Bengali. <laughs> um, and she's setting up for her birthday party until her two aunties unexpectedly show up um, and burst into a bread making competition. And the niece must decide which bread is best, Navajo fry bread or Mingali roti. <laughs> and in doing so, she must find domestic harmony, like bread. So my short film is called Legend of Fry Roti, Rise of the Dough. You can go to the next slide. These are some of my behind the scenes photos. Um, so I started pre-production last year in January, 2023, where I started working on the script. Um, and I applied to a few grants and I have the great honor of being here and being selected for Vision Makers um, Creative Shorts Fellowship. I was also awarded First People's Fund and Georgia Film Impact. Um, and then I moved into casting earlier this year. I worked with Myth Under Casting where I found my most amazing <laughs> actor aunties, um, Lori Tapahanso to play my Navajo auntie and Nayab Hussein to play my Bengali auntie. Um, and then went into production and filmed in June. So I'm currently in post-production at the rough cut phase, uh, heading soon into fine cut picture lock. Um, and then looking for sound mixer, colorist and composer. You can go to the next slide. Um, so I wrote this story because I wanted to tell a story about 
my family. I growing up have always been asked what it was like to grow up in a household that's both Indians, like being both indigenous to the land and also daughter of an immigrant. Um, and for me, that growing up in a multi-language, multi-religious, multicultural household was the norm until my aunties would show up. <laughs> and something that both cultures have in common, um, in my experience, is just this like deep anti-culture. So like aunties from Reservation Dogs and aunties from like Mindy Kaling's Never Have I Ever um, <laughs> in a room. Um, and food is just so important to both cultures. So I wanted to tell this story um, uh, in the highest form of comedy, which is puns. <laughs>